A reading from 1 John. Beloved, let us love one another because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father has sent his Son as the Savior of the world. God abides in those who confess that Jesus is the Son of God, and they abide in God. So we have known and believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness on the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. We love because he loved us. He first loved us. Those who say, I love God, and hate their brothers or sisters are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God who they have not seen. The commandment we have from him is this, those who love God must love their brothers and sisters also. The word of the Lord. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer because the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my father. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that the father will give you whatever you ask him in my name. I am giving you these commands so that you may love one another. Let us pray. Come, Holy Spirit, fill our hearts uh, today so we can hear your word. Lord God, help us to understand what it means to live a life of love empowered by the Holy Spirit. And we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Happy Mother's Day once again to all the mothers out there and those who are watching us uh, um, online. Um, I hope you all have a great day, and it's a beautiful day here on Hilton Head Island if you're here, uh, so um, enjoy uh, this time to celebrate your moms. Uh, Speaking of moms, I don't know uh, what uh, it was like when you were a kid, but moms are famous for giving advice to their kids, or like I'd say, strong suggestions or outright commands uh, to remind them, to keep them kind of on the path. And after doing a little research, here are some of the top things that moms tended to say through the years. If so-and-so jumped off a bridge, would you jump off a bridge as well? Some of you remember your mom saying something like that. For those of you who are a little more like juvenile delinquent, maybe your mom or dad said this, if you do it and get caught and go to jail, you will spend the night. We've all probably heard this, elbows off the table. And when you made your mom really mad, she might have said, wipe that smile off your face or I'm going to wipe it off for you. (laughs) 
And then there's always the conversation stopper or the argument stopper, because I said so. Um, and then some of the real practical moms had great advice for kids, especially in cold places, like never eat yellow snow. <laughs> or in those places with lots of thunderstorms, don't take a shower in the thunderstorm, which, uh, you know, may, may be true or not true, whether you get electrocuted. And, um, and then there's the advice, no matter how old you are, if you don't have anything nice to say, keep your mouth shut. And then uh, there's this one, maybe for folks who are a little older here, they might know where this place actually is. And who do you think you are, the Queen of Sheba? <laughs> no one really knows where Sheba is, but, um, but hey, uh, I guess the point is you're not a queen, right? But probably uh, one of the most timeless advice that both moms and dads and maybe even teachers uh, might have told you through the years is, consider the source. And the reason that was said is oftentimes if you're the victim of gossip or people being mean to you, your mom or your dad might remind you to consider where this information was coming from. Consider that person who was saying that, maybe they were hurting, maybe they were just trying to lash out and you happened to get in their path. When you think of consider the source, you might think of the modern day news. So oftentimes a news station doesn't vet their sources and all of a sudden some news can't, comes out that is not true and it spreads rapidly. And unfortunately chaos and uh, untrue slander gossip is just goes rampant on the web. However, if you do vet your sources, you can have very reliable information that can get out to people very, very quickly. When we also think of sources, we think of water sources. And we all know that if the water source is contaminated, it can cause illness, disease, cancer, sickness. We've seen documentaries about this in different places in our country where a water source was contaminated and everybody who drew from that water was impacted and oftentimes in very negative ways. But at the same time, using that same analogy, if we have a good source, that water can help people to flourish. It can bring life to people, life to crops. A good water source is incredibly valuable. This morning, I want you to consider the source of the most important thing in our life. There have been countless songs, novels, and movies about this concept, about this word. Interpersonal relationships are based on this word. And if you can't guess it, if you weren't paying attention to the scripture, this word is love. You see, here is the good news for all of us this morning. We have a reliable source that created love and operates through love. You see, God is the source of love, and he made this love known through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we are called to tap into this love. A matter of fact, as believers in Christ, I know this is going to sound weird, but we're called to become professional lovers. Now, maybe not from the radio song you're thinking of from way back, or, uh, but we're called to not only have the knowledge of God's unique love for us, but to identify with this love and to put it into practice daily in our lives. When we do this, our lives and the lives of others, just like that good water source, will flourish. So this morning, we're going to take a closer look at John's gospel, but uh, we're going to spend most of our time in John's epistle. And they can contain two famous passages that have to do with love, with God being the source of love. This will help us to understand God's love for us and how we can live into and live out God's love. John reminds us right away in his epistle, in his letter, he says this, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. In other words, God is the source of love. God is the one who gives us the meaning of love. God is the source. But so often people do it in reverse. Whatever they think love is, they try to put that on God. Whatever their feeling, whatever their sentiments are, they think that God should feel and act the same way. But God doesn't operate on our biases or our misconceptions on love. God is the source. We're not the source. The word used by the uh, translators uh, of, the, of these uh, New Testament letters and scriptures in Greek, that's what they were translated into, is agape. Now, agape was one of those words, it's a word for love in Greek, that really didn't have a whole lot of strength to it. It was just sort of like, yeah, love. There wasn't much behind it. But the reason uh, the people who translated the Hebrew Bible and uh, they translated the words of the apostles into this Greek, used the word agape, was for that very reason. They elevated this word 
that didn't have all these other meanings to it. It's almost like in the 1960s when the word cool no longer meant just being cool because you're in air conditioning, but it took on a whole other meaning. Or today, some teenagers, and this is probably outdating me because it's probably already gone, they like to say, oh, that is tight, or they used to a couple of years ago. Who knows what they're saying now? But the word tight, again, had a whole other set of meanings as something that was pretty awesome. Well, agape uh, became something more because they used the word from Hebrew, this word ahav, which was a strong word that indicated the unconditional love of God. And not only the unconditional love, but in the New Testament, the unconditional love of God that is given to us through his son, Jesus Christ, through his life, death, and resurrection, as I indicated earlier. It is not a love that takes. It is a love that gives. This agape, this unconditional love, was demonstrated by God, as I said just a minute ago, in the person of Jesus Christ. So rather, rather than just telling us about God through the prophets of the Old Testament and the historical accounts, God became a person in Jesus Christ and walked among us. This is how he showed us what his love was all about. It was a show and tell. He sent his one, uh, John writes, he sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Jesus Christ modeled this agape love. Love is the event that God spoke through Jesus Christ's life. It was the event where he atoned for our sins on the cross and rose again so we can all have the hope of eternal life. In Jesus' life, he lived out this kind of love. There's a story in Mark's gospel where this rich young ruler comes over to him and this guy is like the Eagle Scout of his day. He's done everything right. Never does anything wrong. He was given a resume to Jesus. It was like, look at me. Look at all that I do. I do this. I do that. I, you know. And Jesus uh, looked at the man, and it says, and he loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. Unfortunately, this rich young ruler couldn't quite give up all his riches, and he walked away sad. But Jesus loved him. Jesus knew ahead of time what his response would be, but he came to conquer all this chaos, the sin in the world of trying to do life on our own without God, and he loved people as he was doing it. When Jesus, right before Jesus rose Lazarus from the dead, he wept. He was caught up in the movement, uh, uh, the moment because he was fully God and fully human, and the Jews that were around there said, look how he loved Lazarus. Jesus loved people. And he came to die on the cross to conquer, not just to raise Lazarus in that moment, but that was symbolic of what was going to happen just a little later. He would die on the cross and conquer death, conquer the power that sin has in our lives so all of us who believe could tap into God's love and be living under that banner of love. You know, it's interesting, uh, on the cross, sometimes we forget exactly what happened, but Greg indicated this in a sermon, I indicated this in the past, but on the cross, he not only destroyed death, but the curtain in the temple was torn in two as a symbolic that all of us who believe can have access to God. God demonstrates his own love for us in this, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Bono, the lead singer for U2, wrote about Jesus' death on the cross and how he identified with the sin that put him there. He writes in the song, When Love Came to Town, I was there when they crucified my Lord. I held the scabbard when the soldiers drew his sword. I threw the dice when they pierced his side, but I've seen love conquer the great divide. In other words, he understood the access that was available because of Jesus dying on the cross for our sins, that kind of love. And the next line of the song says, when love comes to town, I'm going to catch that train. Well, John, the author of this letter and the author of the gospel is one who caught the love train. A matter of fact, he was considered the apostle of love. He understood so much that Jesus loved him that he called himself the one that Jesus loved. 
Now, some people think that he's being a little arrogant there, and you know, doesn't Jesus love the other uh, apostles, other disciples? But you know what I think it was? John wrote this gospel after Jesus had been risen from the dead. He wrote his epistle as the early church was struggling and trying to live out this love. But he understood who Jesus was. He understood that he was God's son, that he walked among us. And he understood that John, a regular guy, like himself, was loved by God through this person of Jesus Christ. He was so excited about it in that epistle we just read, he said love about 27 times because he wanted us to understand how much God loves us. He wanted us to catch that train. So we as believers who put our faith in Christ are called to live lives of love. We are incorporated into God's family as believers and through the power of the Holy Spirit, we start understanding that our lifeblood as believers is love. It's kind of like people who are big Clemson fans and they're like, well, I bleed orange. You've probably heard people say stuff like that about their college football team, which is kind of weird, right? But for us as believers, we bleed love. That's who we are. That's the main event. That's the main thing. We love because he first loved us. As we live into this life of this agape love, as I mentioned earlier, we are reminded of God's love and it, of God's commitment for us to love each other. John writes, dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. John wanted us to understand this wasn't an option. This is a command this isn't like lower level Christianity. We love people, but then we start talking about the real complicated stuff. No, this is the main course. God lives in us and his love is made complete in us when we love one another. So in other words, we as believers don't need to live scattered lives or to live lives where we're like that puzzle that's missing pieces. We can be filled by Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. We can be filled with the love that helps us when life gets difficult, we live out of God's prior love to us, not us trying to love a bunch so God will like us. Because God gave us this love, we're able to give it to other people. And as I said earlier, this love is not an option for us as believers. John made this very clear, and he said, whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. Whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command, not suggestion. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. And in his gospel, he said, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. You know, this can sound overwhelming because if we think about our lives, oftentimes there are very difficult people to love. Sometimes right in church, people that we know, which is people hurt us. Some of us have wounds from our past. But God does not leave us alone on the sidelines saying, you better go love people. Let's see how you do. Otherwise, I'm taking you out of the game. That's not what he does. He empowers us with the Holy Spirit. That way, when we get off track, he reminds us of who we are, that we're a part of his family, and his family is marked by love. He has a body of believers in this local church and the big church, that's the church all over the world, that reminds us over and over again that we are to live lives of love. This is not an idea. It's not a feeling. It is a relationship we have with God through Jesus Christ. And as we live into this relationship, as we humble ourselves daily and ask God to fill us with the Holy Spirit, we experience this love in powerful and real ways. So just a reminder, God is the source of love. It's not us trying to conjure up enough love so God will like us. He demonstrated his love in a show and tell way by bringing Jesus Christ to walk among us and die for our sins and destroy death on the cross. And all of us who are believers can live under his love, his agape love, which is bigger than us, even on our best day when we're feeling like we're really good at loving people. 
Maybe today you're having trouble connecting these truths, as I said earlier. Maybe you've been hurt. Maybe you're feeling a time where you're feeling very distant from God. But I want to encourage you today. God is close to the brokenhearted. When we're feeling in the season of drought, feeling dry, he longs to fill you each day. You know, in a lot of traditions in Christianity, you have your conversion and then you just kind of go on and live life. And we believe that too. Yes, there's a time when you come and say yes to Jesus, no to self. For some of us, we may not have that clear moment. We kind of grew into it from the church. For other of us, it was a very powerful kind of mountaintop experience. But we're not called to just do a one time, but every day to surrender ourselves to Christ and saying, I can't do this on my own. On my own, I'm a, I'm a very bad lover. I don't even like people that much. I need your help today. We're called to do that every day. Just like we recharge our cell phone every day, we do the same as we start each day. He provides us with the Holy Spirit to help us. John writes, this is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us the Spirit. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them and they in God, and so we know and rely on the love God has for us. Every day, rely on the love, not that you can conjure up, but the love that God has for you. Then you'll become a great lover every day because the love's coming from something greater than you. The other reminder for all of you, it's like when I played high school baseball and we had tryouts. We had to go to the coach's door to see if our name was on the list. And I've used this analogy a long time ago. Your name's on the list. Matter of fact, everybody is. Christ died for everybody, and he's inviting everybody to be on the team. But we got to show up. we got to say yes to Christ, and I'm going to live and be part of this team. But at the same time that we're all invited into this relationship with Christ, we all can reject that too. Luther said, we can exercise ourselves in grace. If we don't, we could go grow cold and adrift for those of us who are believers. And for those of us who aren't, C.S. Lewis reminds us that if we're afraid of loving, if we can't imagine that a God could love us, he said, there's one way to protect your heart then. He said, if you want to make sure of keeping it intact, you must give it no, to no one, not even an animal. Wrap it up carefully, round with hobbies and a little luxuries. Avoid all entanglements. Lock it up safe in the casket or coffin of your selfishness. But in that casket, safe, dark, motionless, airless, it will change. It will not be broken. It will become unbreakable, impenetrable, irredeemable. Because really, to love is to be vulnerable. We're all invited into that kind of relationship. Yes, the world is different. Loving is difficult. Loving people, our hearts do get broken. But God continually fills us through this body of believers, the greater body of the believers around the world, and through the power of the Holy Spirit. Tap into that love today. We as a church are called to do this, not just individually, but corporately. John writes, God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this wor world, we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear is to do with punishment. The one who fear is not made perfect in love. We as a body of believers do not need to fear judgment. The same God, the same Jesus who met us on the road of redemption, when we said yes to God, no to self, is the same one we'll meet in judgment. When we understand that we live life with a new vigor, we live life with love, we're not afraid to have a heart that's broken. We live life with courage. We don't live an escapist attitude of a church that hides from culture. We go out and we impact culture with feet firmly planted, we go and love our actual neighbor, not our theoretical neighbor. We bring, we're, the, we're the feet that bring good news of the love of God. I want to leave us with one thought and then a prayer that the Apostle Paul has for us. All of you all know uh, doctors, there might be even some in this room, 
When they go to medical school, when they're done, they start their practice. And I know comedians have joked about that, saying they don't want a doctor practicing on them, right? But uh, the practice they're talking about is actually everything they've learned, everything they knew, that they put it into practice and they start it. They start their practice. Well, everyone here as a believer has gone to medical school. You know enough right here. Now it's time for us to live this out every day. Put it into practice through the power of the Holy Spirit. The Apostle Paul prayed for all believers in the church in Ephesus and Ephesians and for believers like you and I with these words. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Let me pray for us. Lord God, we thank you for the Apostle Paul's prayer. Fill us with your love today. Lord, I pray for anybody here who has a broken heart. Perhaps life has been very difficult this last year or maybe even this week or maybe even this morning. Lord, remind them of your great love for them. I pray just like John who understood that he was loved by God, the one that Jesus loved, that we would understand that we are the ones that Jesus loves too. Lord, help us to respond to that, to live it out through the power of your Holy Spirit. And we ask this all in Jesus' name, amen.